This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, President Trump is continuing threats to close the southern border if Mexico does not stop the flow of asylum seekers arriving at the U.S. border. But he partially backed off his warning in remarks at the Oval Office Tuesday, saying Mexico had increased its apprehensions of immigrants since he first made the threat last week. I'm ready to close it. If I have to close it, Mexico, as you know, as of yesterday, has been starting to apprehend a lot of people at their southern border, coming in from Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador, and they've uh, well, they're really apprehending thousands of people. And it's the first time, really, in decades that this has taken place, and this should have taken place a long time ago. Trump said uh, he would 100 percent follow through on his plan to close the border if no deal was reached with Congress on immigration. He also said he wanted to, quote, get rid of judges in immigration cases. Economic and policy experts warn a border closure between the U.S. and Mexico could result in billions of dollars of losses to the economy by disrupting trade and the daily flow of goods and people between the two countries. Members of Trump's own administration have expressed concerns with the possible closure. A Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, said closing the border would be, quote, catastrophic. But Trump said Tuesday he was willing to shut the border anyway, saying, quote, security is more important to me than trade. On Monday, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador said his administration would help regulate Central American migrants passing through Mexican territory to the United States. Me pidieron. I was asked to be prudent, and I think that's the best thing, to have a policy of friendship with the U.S. government, a relationship of good neighbors with the U.S. government, and to act with a lot of caution, to not get hooked in a confrontation in a row. Claro. Tenemos que ayudar. Of course, we have to help, because Central American migrants pass through our territory, and we have to bring order to that migration so that it's legal and, at the same time, for human rights to be protected. So that's where we are at. But let's stay calm. The thing is, we would enter into this dynamic, and I prefer love and peace. Of course, I take it seriously that we should act with caution. As Trump's border showdown continues, we turn to look at the first 100 days of the presidency of Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador, Mexico's first leftist president in decades. In Mexico City, we're joined by Humberto Beck, a professor at the College of Mexico, co-editor of The Future is Today, Radical Ideas for Mexico. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Humberto Beck. Um, can you talk about both what AMLO is saying about the border, how he's dealing with President Trump, but most importantly, what these four months of this presidency of Andres Manuel López Obrador have been about. Sure. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, I think López Obrador uh, doesn't want to confront Trump openly, uh, but he's trying to uh, create some uh, bridges of cooperation with other aspects, other dimensions of the U.S. government. For example, he uh, had a meeting recently with a U.S. congressman uh, about the possibility of creating some kind of uh, inversion program uh, in southern Mexico and Central America. I think that's what he wants to do, because he's not really trying to stop the flow of migrants. Because he knows, even though he doesn't want to acknowledge it openly, because he wants to avoid this confrontation with Trump, he knows that sending back migrants to Central America is sending back these people to an uh, unlivable situation because of violence. Uh, so I think that what he wants to do is just not to confront Trump openly, try to uh, work in some kind of cooperation program with the U.S. and try to create what could be, if it is ambitious enough, some kind of Marshall or new Marshall program with Southern Mexico and Central America. Uh, and about the first uh, months of the uh, López Obrador presidency, um, I would say that there is a very powerful change in the discourse of the government. Uh, of the federal government. If you contrast what uh, a president like López Obrador says to what the recent, the other recent presidents of Mexico have said, there is a real change. So, for example, López Obrador is one of the few Mexican politicians who talk about inequality as the main problem of Mexico, I, and I think he is right. So that's, uh, uh, to a great extent, the reason why he won uh, last year the elections. So 
but now the question is to find out whether he's really going to deliver in that sense. So, so far, he has created a very ambitious uh, social spending program uh, that is going to be funded, according to his uh, calculations, with cuts in government spending in other areas, especially what he considers to be excessive spending uh, of uh, Mexican government officials. So this is probably going to work for a while, but in the long run, what is needed is a deep uh, tax reform. Because in Mexico, you know, the richer classes, the richest people really don't pay taxes. So I think a program of social spending as ambitious as López Obrador's uh, cannot really be sustainable if there is not uh, some kind of deep radical tax reform. Well, uh, uh, Umberto Beck, I'm wondering if you could comment on the enormous popularity, even greater, that he has uh, now than when he was elected. Uh, there's some polls showing he has 80 percent favorability rating uh, among the population. And to what degree the, the style that he's adopted, for instance, selling the presidential jet, not only the presidential jet uh, uh, that was just uh, basically put into service uh, in, the, in the last presidency, but also selling six the other government-owned jets, refusing to live in the presidential palace, uh, uh, holding daily press conferences to reach out to, to the press and the public about his, uh, his stance, closing the notorious, the most notorious prison uh, in Mexico, where many had been tortured over decades. Uh, to what degree this has had an impact on the population, saying this really is a different kind of politician? Well, that's definitely one of the main aspects behind his popularity. So I think people in Mexico feel that there's a, a sense of authenticity in what López Obrador says and what he does. Uh, so uh, this symbol, for example, of the selling of the presidential plane was uh, really important in his discourse uh, about austerity. Uh, but austerity not in the sense, in the neoliberal sense of cutting, especially social spending, but austerity in the sense of uh, cutting off the excessive, uh, let's say, luxuries that many uh, government officials used to, used to have before he came to power. Uh, he also has uh, made this policy of having every day, very early in the morning, probably about to start right now, uh, these conferences with the, with the press. Uh, so this is also a very important change, because uh, the previous president, Peña Nieto, almost practically never had uh, a free, open, spontaneous encounter with the press. So uh, López Obrador has changed that, and so this, I think, uh, adds up to this sense of authenticity that he can, that he displays, uh, and that is really perceived by the by the Mexican public. Uh, however, I think there are a couple of issues that might turn problematic in the in the next years. So, for example, there has been also a, a, an important change in discourse about security. Uh, and about uh, the fight against crime. But the concrete measures that this new government is about to adopt are ambivalent in that sense. So there might be a clash between the sense of the discourse that the president has adopted and the actual implications of the policy, such as the creation of this called, uh, so-called National Guard that is supposed to be a hybrid between military and civilian uh, elements, but that leaves open the door for a continuation of the policy of militarization that has characterized Mexico in the last 12 years, that has created a great toll in human suffering uh, through uh, uh, the disappearances of uh, tens of thousands of people, the murder or killing of hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, a large amount of human rights abuses on the part of uh, the military in Mexico. Um, the issue of the killing of journalists, I think we're up to maybe the fifth um, journalist, a radio journalist, Omar Camacho, who was just killed in Sinaloa, uh, the targeting of them, and what AMLO is doing about this? Well, I think uh, he acknowledges the problem, but he hasn't really addressed it uh, in a specific way. So, but that issue of the relationship between the new government and the press is really important, because, of course, there is the issue of the killing of journalists that um, that has been going on for, for almost a decade in Mexico. But there is also the issue of the relationship between the government and the press in general. So uh, 
that might be also one of the problems coming in the next few years because AMLO has adopted, or as he's known in Mexico, has adopted this uh, attitude of sometimes confronting the press and saying that they are not really uh, honest, that they, uh, he's not using the word fake news, but somehow implying that they are uh, disseminating false information, that they want to attack him. So I think that that creates uh, uh, an atmosphere for the media that is not uh, the best uh, for liberty of uh, uh, speech. I want to ask you about his labor policy uh, as well, because one of the things uh, that he, he did was uh, he doubled the minimum wage in the, in the uh, uh, in the northern border areas, uh, that led that led very soon afterwards, in the many of the maquilas, to strikes by workers demanding sharp increases in in wages. And surprisingly, the government remained neutral. Because I remember back in the days of Salinas or even Cedillo, uh, if workers went on strike, especially in the foreign-owned maquilas, the government would intervene uh, and uh, even arrest strike leaders at the time. But at least the government in this stage remained neutral. How has he been seen in terms of his labor policy so far? Well, I think this uh, change in the attitude towards labor policy is part of this larger, larger turn in bringing back inequality as the main issue of uh, the new government. So one of the things that they have done is to, I think, try to vindicate the dignity of workers through, as you mentioned, the increase in the minimum wage and also through this respect against, uh, uh, against strikes. And also, I think what he's trying to do is to, uh, let's say, uh, create a new equilibrium between, let's say, labor and capital. So even though AMLO is far from being a radical, so all this talk about he being uh, a new Maduro or a new Chavez uh, is not really true. So he's not really, he doesn't really want to expropriate industries. He doesn't really want to uh, abolish private property or something like that. Uh, but he really wants to uh, create this, as I mentioned, this new equilibrium between the uh, factors of production. Uh, and so I think uh, there is a real opportunity there of increasing the uh, quality of lives of workers in Mexico. However, uh, there are also in that area some aspects that are, uh, that we might become source seconds. of trouble in the future. So, uh, so uh, sorry? We have five seconds. Uh, uh, the, so, for example, uh, actually, Alberto Beck will have of, to leave it uh, there. But we're also going to do an interview in Spanish at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.